everyone. Welcome to the next installment in the cover to cover reading the Bible from Genesis to Revelation lecture series. Today we're looking at the book of Acts and I've titled this lecture, These Are the Days. And if you remember, if you've watched the introduction or the lecture on Luke, you know that Luke and Acts are a two-part gospel, if you will, written by the author Luke. He was a physician and travel companion of the Apostle Paul, and in the book of Acts we find some first-hand accounts from him recording the experiences he had with Paul on Paul's missionary journeys. The dating of both Luke and Acts is sometime after, at least after 62 AD, because that's the date for the events recorded in Acts 28. So we assume that he wrote both of these somewhere after that, but before the time that John wrote his gospel, so probably in the late 60s, early 70s. The audience for his work is, in particular, a patron named Theophilus who would have funded and helped Luke secure the resources needed to write these books. But he also, of course, is writing for a larger audience, particularly Gentile followers of Jesus Christ. His is a two-part series, as I said, and it's meant to be read as one continuous whole. So when I teach the entirety of the Bible, I like to have you read John first and then Luke and Acts to keep the integrity of those being basically one giant book. So Acts provides for us the only historical narrative of the early church. And so we're very glad that Luke wrote this book because it gives us so much insight into what that world looked like. It serves as the bridge between the Gospels and the letters of the New Testament, which will address many of the issues that the church confronted. In the genre, because there's a unification between Luke and Acts, we're looking at more historiography than we are biography, because Luke is not simply telling the story of Jesus, he's also revealing how God's purpose played out in the life of Jesus, and then its continuation in the life of the early church. So his purpose is to give us chronological progression of events, which of course also coincides with a geographical progression. It all makes sense because he's giving us the events as they happened. And it culminates with Jesus, in in Luca's anyway, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and the events that take place there. That's where Acts begins. And then Acts goes back out. So we see Jesus, you know, his ministry is in the region of Galilee, and then he heads to Jerusalem. Acts starts in Jerusalem heads to the rest of Judea and then out into the rest of the Roman Empire. Um, through these books, Luke draws a continuous line from Israel, from their scriptures, their life and community, to the events of Jesus, his life and his death and resurrection, all of it, and then to the community of the new believers. So all are part of plan A. Uh, what happened with Jesus in the early church and the, and the church today is not plan B because Israel failed. It's always meant to be part of plan A. And so his books provide the early church with continuity and understanding, especially for the Gentile believers, that this wasn't like completely brand new. God had been planting seeds and had a plan and a purpose for this all the way back tracing to the beginnings of creation. It gives them identity. They are part of something bigger than themselves. So therefore also gives them purpose and validation that they have made the right choice, that it's good to have faith in Jesus Christ, that yes, they may be undergoing persecution, but that doesn't mean that they made the wrong choice. It's part of what it means to follow Jesus. There's also a reassurance that it's okay that Jesus hasn't returned right away. That starts to become an issue in the early church because they thought Jesus' second coming was imminent, that it would be in their lifetime. And so as they get older and that first generation that lived during the time of Christ, as they pass away, people start to go, well, maybe he's never coming back at all. And so they start to doubt their faith and struggle with the ramifications of what that might mean. And so Luke reassures them, no, there's 
supposed to be a gap. Of course, even he couldn't have imagined probably how many years have gone by. We don't know how many years are still left, but there is a gap. And as we will see in the letters of the New Testament, um, this gap is so that God can be exercise patience and wait for everybody to come to him. Luke also emphasizes that people need not fear any earthly power, even the Roman government, as vicious as they could be, um, that God is sovereign over everything. Jesus is Lord, not just of earthly realms and kingdoms, but of the spiritual realm as well. So the structure of Acts, it starts with the origins of the church located in Jerusalem and sort of the birth the anointing and the testing of the church. So kind of patterning how he structured the gospel um, of Luke. And then we've got the growth of the church. So Luke started with the origins of Jesus, then the growth of his ministry, and then, you know, expanding that out with his death and resurrection. Acts is the same, the origins of the church, the growth of that church, and finally the expansion as it's taken farther and farther into the Roman Empire. Um, and so as the gospel spreads, we will see lives changed, traditions reevaluated, a lot of discussion about what do we need to keep from the Jewish faith, what carries over into this new expression, and what do we throw away because it's been fulfilled in Jesus. And then as the gospel spreads further, there's a lot of talk about unification between the Jewish and the Gentile communities of believers into one new community. Um, the first leader that Acts focuses on is the Apostle Peter. He's the leader of the early church, particularly the church in Jerusalem. The Apostle Paul becomes the leader of the church in the rest of the world, sometimes referred to as the, di the diaspora, the places outside of Jerusalem where the gospel is taken. And so we see the geographical progression from Jerusalem to Galilee and Judea, the regions in which Jesus ministered, and then into the Roman Empire and quote unquote, the ends of the earth. Themes that we find in Acts, lots of focus on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit undergirds everything that happens here. Uh, as we know, before Jesus died, he said, I'm dying, but I'm and then, then I'm going to be taken up into heaven and resurrected, but I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit comes and becomes the primary influence in the church and for followers of Christ. The Holy Spirit is what enables this very fledgling group of believers to grow in faith and number and to witness with bold faith. It's amazing to see the difference between the disciples just before Jesus is crucified and the disciples in Acts. Peter denied Jesus three times and yet in Acts he is on fire, bold, preaching, doesn't care if he's thrown into prison, cares not what the, what the rest of the world thinks of him. He's like, I can't not preach and preach with boldness. So this begins in, with the events of Pentecost in Acts 2. This represents a reversal of the Tower of Babel. So if you remember that story all the way back from Genesis 11, uh, if you remember the people were trying to build a tower up to God and God was like, that's it. I have to scatter them. Otherwise, they're going to put their minds together and come up with some nefarious deeds. And so he scatters human beings and breaks up their language so that it makes it harder for them to communicate. It makes it harder for them to work together. That's one of the ramifications of sin. But here, the reverse happens. So the disciples are gathered in the upper room. The Holy Spirit descends upon them. They start speaking and spring and not spraying, praying loudly. And everyone that is gathered in the city hears and understands in their own native language. This is amazing. So again, reversal of what happens at Babel. Now there's unification. Now there's shared understanding, shared community. And so this is the beginning of the good news being proclaimed to all nations. The Holy Spirit changes lives. As I said, Peter is one huge example of this, but there are many all throughout Acts. Almost everybody is an example of how the Holy Spirit has changed them.
uh, we see the anointing of workers in Acts 6. So because the church is growing, they need more people to participate. It can't just be the 12. And so they anoint other workers. And this leads to Stephen becoming one of the workers for the early church. And he um, sorrowfully is martyred in Acts 8. It's tr such a tragedy. And he's so amazing in his faith. He gives the whole story of Israel, basically, and dies with great faith. And from this, the church, it, the church becomes scattered. After he's martyred, the disciples kind of break apart and everyone heads off to, the, to a different region. Peter stays in Jerusalem, but a lot of the other ones go out. And we see some of those stories, um, Philip and the eunuch, for instance, of you know them going out and ministering in other places. And so this becomes fulfilling of Jesus' prophecy, the prophecy of all the pro of the Old Testament prophets, that indeed God would be preached everywhere. And so through this terrible tragedy, God is able to send the people out to speak the good news. We also see the conversion and ministry of Paul, which dominates most of Acts. The Holy Spirit is the reason for the spread of the gospel through faithful believers and most notable is Paul. Paul, who persecuted the early Christians, becomes the fiercest worker for Jesus, the best proclaimer of the gospel, the author of so many of our beautiful New Testament letters. And so Acts sees this shift. It shifts from focusing on Peter and the church in Jerusalem to focusing on Paul as we follow the thread of the dissemination of the good news. So Peter stays behind and we kind of leave his story to follow along with Paul because Paul represents that good news going out into farther and farther reaches of the world. So another theme is faithful witnessing. It will be worldwide. So beginning in Judea, going out to Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. It requires persecution, suffering, and even sometimes martyrdom. And we see this happen in Acts. Jesus told us this would happen. He warned his followers that they would face these things, and it becomes fulfilled in this early church. But what we notice is often the believers don't pray for rescue. Uh, Peter, when he's first confronted by the Jewish authorities who are like, you need to stop talking about Jesus. And he's like, goes back to his people and says, please pray for me to be even more bold. Um, it's amazing to see the change in him. So they pray for increased boldness despite the threats coming their way. Um, the idea here being we can't focus on what we see. We have to focus on the unseen truths of God and the spiritual war that is going on all around us. Um, and so this, you can find this in Acts 4. We also have in Faithful Witnessing the inclusion of many unlikely people. We noticed in the Gospel of Luke that he talked a lot about women and included them. They, are, they represent Jesus kind of breaking wide open the door of ministry and access to God. And that continues in Acts. So we have Dorkish's story in chapter 9. We have Lydia in chapter 16. She's so big in the early church. She becomes the leader of a house church herself, uh, be, you know, presumably preaching and teaching in that house church. And we have Priscilla in chapter 18. Those are just a few of the women. Um, we see that faithful witnesses are empowered by the Holy Spirit. I'll talk more about that in a minute. We see that there's a call for response with witnessing. Um, it's not just, oh, let's listen to a nice message, but Holy Spirit inspired faithful witnessing engenders a response from the people. And the, the hopeful right response that we want everyone to have is repentance that leads to forgiveness of sins and entrance into the community. And we see that faithful witnessing is best done in community with unity, everyone working together to continue the work that Christ began. And when this happens, when it's done in community, it gets great results. Acts also talks about the new covenant. There is a rift in the beginning between Jewish and Gentile Christians. It all comes to a head in Acts 15 with the Jerusalem Council. 
the Jewish believers were still holding on to some of their Jewish traditions, the practice of Sabbath, circumcision, um, table laws, and, you know, who you ate with, table laws and food fellowship. And uh, they struggle with giving that up. And it makes sense. It's always hard to you know, we cling to tradition and in so many ways, tradition is a wonderful thing. But Jesus has come and said, I'm doing a new thing. There's a new covenant. You no longer have to be physically circumcised. It's a circumcision of the heart. Um, there's spiritual things. You don't, it doesn't matter what you eat anymore because it's not what goes into your body that makes you unclean. It's what is already there. It's what comes out of your body. It's your heart. It's your intentions. It's your thoughts that, that Jesus is after. And so Peter really struggles with this. Um, and we see God change his heart through his interaction with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. That's just such a good story. If you weren't able to get to it in your reading, I encourage you to go back and look at it and notice how Peter is changed by that interaction and realizes that the Holy Spirit is for everybody. He sees Cornelius's response and that the Spirit descends and all these people get baptized and he realizes like, who am I to impose restrictions on these people? That That's done now. And so it comes to a head, as I said, in Acts 15, they meet together, the Jerusalem Council, and kind of wrestle with this issue with um, Paul saying, no, we we don't need to adhere to those old traditions any longer and the struggle that they come up with there. So Jesus, as we know via the new covenant, he fulfilled the law of the Old Testament. He renders what was once unclean, clean. So now, as I said, the focus is on our hearts, our inward purity through faith. No longer physical circumcision, as I said, it's inward circumcision of the heart, the cutting away of the sinful nature, and that is accomplished by Jesus' blood on the cross. So uncleanliness no longer comes from the outside, people and food, but from the inside, hearts and minds. So as I've said, the major focus in Acts is on the journeys of Paul. Indeed, most of Acts focuses on his story. So who is Paul? He was born in Tarsus. He was named originally Saul. He was born to Jewish parents from the tribe of Benjamin, but he was also a Roman citizen. He studied, studied under Gamaliel, who was a great rabbi, and he was a Pharisee and engaged in persecution of the early church. It's believed that he even killed some of the earliest believers of Jesus. He was also a tent maker by trade. He's converted on the road to Damascus, and there's three different versions of this story in Acts. In Acts 9, in Acts 22, and in Acts 26. And each kind of has a different telling, some different details, which is consistent with how we are when we retell a story, depending on the audience, depending on the nature of the circumstances. We might remember details that we forgot before, or we might intentionally be telling a part of the story because we know that the audience should hear a certain aspect that we didn't tell someone else. So we see that in those differing accounts. Church tradition says that Paul was martyred along with the Apostle Peter, both in Rome under the Emperor Nero, that Paul was beheaded and Peter was crucified upside down because he didn't feel himself worthy of being crucified in the same manner as Jesus Christ. And here's a map of his missionary journeys. We'll look at this as well when we study Paul's letters. Um, and so if you're listening, you might want to take a look at this map on the download. It's available on my website, or you can wait and look at it when we talk about Paul's letters. So Paul becomes one of the chief proclaimers and defenders of Jesus' resurrection. He testifies to its reality and to its significance. He shows us what the best type of Holy Spirit-filled witnessing looks like. And there's a focus on Paul as an accused man in the final eight chapters. He is repeatedly imprisoned. He is called to speak in his own defense, as well as in defense of the gospel. And yet he never backs down from his call. 
Luke demonstrates that Paul maintained a consistent and faithful witness in the face of this opposition and persecution, and so we as Christians are to follow his example. Acts ends without a real sense of conclusion. Paul's still alive at the end of Acts. We don't get the story of his death in the Bible anyway. This is intentional. Um, Luke wanted us, we as believers, followers, the church, to carry on the mission. Uh, the mission of Jesus Christ does not die with any one person. We are a community, a fellowship of believers, and one generation carries on the call from the next. So it is much bigger than us. We each play an important part, but not so important that when we die, it all falls apart. Um, someone else picks up and carries on where we left off. So what do we take away from Acts? Well, it serves really to strengthen the Christian movement. At the time it's being written, they're facing fierce opposition by Jewish authorities who don't believe Jesus was the Messiah. They're facing opposition from Rome who mistrusts this group of people who are now saying that everyone's equal and they don't participate in a lot of the things of Roman society because they don't want to be seen as worshiping idols. And so they're kind of standoffish. Um, there's a lot of separation in family units where one family member believes and the others don't. And so they're ostracized from their families. It's a real struggle. And it would have been easy to look at all those circumstances and say, this is too much. This is too hard. If Jesus was who he said he was, then shouldn't this be easier? Shouldn't my path be blessed? Um, I shouldn't be enduring all this kind of hardship. And the story here is that that's not true. Uh, part of being a follower of Jesus means picking up our crosses. It, it means enduring persecution and suffering to some degree. And it sometimes means that we will be ostracized from greater society, even as we, we try to take the gospel message into society. So Luke confirms cr the Christian's interpretation and experience of God's redemptive purposes. Like, keep going. You're doing the right thing. You're believing in the truth. The Holy Spirit is with you. Despite all of this persecution, the church is growing exponentially. That alone is testimony to the reality of everything they're teaching and of the truth of the Holy Spirit. Because any other movement that faced this kind of persecution would have died off at some point. The fact that all of the disciples were willing to die, to be martyred for their faith, for, for telling the truth of Jesus' gospel, is just speaks volumes. And so Luke through Acts calls Christians to continue to be faithful witnesses. So Acts becomes an invitation for us to participate faithfully as God's people in the continuing redemptive purposes of God. We are to witness boldly with all of the same power that's available to us in the Holy Spirit. And so that takes us to the end of Acts. We're going to now look next week at the letters of Paul and Paul in particular and kind of introducing him and more about his background and understanding through the letters a lot of what the early church faced. So we know they faced persecution. We already know that from Acts. But we're going to get into the details and the questions that come up. Well, what does it mean? Is it okay if we go to the festival and we eat some meat that had been sacrificed to an idol? Or are we supposed to abstain from that altogether? Um, what do we do with tithing? What do we do with family members that aren't Christians? What do we do if we're working for someone or if we're someone's slave and we're believers and they're not? What do I do if I'm married and I become a Christian and my spouse isn't a Christian? All these kind of just real issues of faith and theology that they had to wrestle with in the early church. We still wrestle with our own versions of those types of questions as well. So that's what we'll turn to in the weeks to come. Um, so I hope you join me for that. And now let us close in prayer. Gracious God, thank you so much for the gift of your Holy Spirit, that indeed you did grow the church exponentially, and there are Christians on every continent in this world, Lord, and yet still there are people who do not know you.
who haven't heard the name of Jesus, who need to hear your gospel truth. And so, Lord, we pray that we would continue to be faithful to take the gospel out into the world, to every single corner, Lord, that it would be preached everywhere and that all would have a chance to know you and to come to you in faith. And we pray that that would be so, God, that your grace and your mercy would be irresistible to people and that they would humble themselves and turn to you and experience the peace and comfort and joy and blessing of your salvation, of your community, and the amazing joy of getting to be your hands and feet. Help us to do that well, God. Give us strength. Give us inspiration and wisdom to know where to go and what to do and what to say. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.